All right. You guys ready to rock and roll? Talk about balance? My phone's ringing. I bet it's my wife or my kids or grandma. Um, so I, I promise you, A, this is going to be fun. B, it's going to be interactive. If it's not interactive, it's your fault. It's not my fault. I just want to be clear on that. Um, and lastly, this is not an advertisement for my company, but I will tell you a little bit about my company. Uh, I don't think there are any chief marketing officers in hospitals in here, and so therefore my hunch is that this will do me no good whatsoever, <laughs> though we are recruiting people. So if you know cool, new, weird Twitter people or others, as you and I talked about, um, please send them my way. I'll give you my information. I'm supposed to take this cool little gadget so I can walk around like uh, Joel Osteen. <laughs> so uh, I'll give the gospel according to me. Um, I don't know what that'll do for you, but hopefully it'll provide some entertainment. Um, so does anyone know what we're going to talk about today, or did you just randomly choose this? Were you like, hmm, that's room 100. They've got to have somebody good in there. I saw that. I'm like, I'm going to rock that guy. That guy has no chance whatsoever. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, he's got like things like something.rom or whatever, and how to build non-secure files in a, in a Ruby on Rails set of whatever, MongoDB. <laughs> Anybody seen that awesome little uh, movie about MongoDB DB versus uh, MySQL? Or these are S no SQL fanboys or whatever. Anybody seen that? You saw it? Look it up. Just look it up. Do yourself a favor. If you want a really good laugh, look that up. Uh, you turn MongoDB on, it just scales right up. It just scales right up. It's, it's web scale. <laughs> it's web scale. That's right. That's right. It's the secret sauce. What are shards? The secret sauce. What is it? The secret sauce in the web scale sauce. No, it's the secret uh, ingredient in the web scale sauce. Good, good. Okay, now that I've geeked out a little bit, a little bit. I'm a CEO, so I'm a kind of a geeky CEO, um, which is kind of fun. So today we're going to talk about the entrepreneur's balanced life. Let me give you a little bit of background on me, but I'm not going to. This isn't about me. This is about hopefully us as a congregation. Uh, you can use that word outside of church or synagogue. I promise you won't get in trouble with the Supreme Court or anything. Um, so we're going to talk about how you balance your life. So we all have, and it doesn't mean that you have to have a spouse or kids. We all have meaningful people in our lives, whether they be spouses or kids or dogs or cats or guinea pigs or friends or whatever, um, whatever your thing is, uh, or, or activities that you like to do. Uh, living a balanced life is important. And as an entrepreneur, you are at a disadvantage. Because having, having started a company, you have embarked upon what I would suggest is up there in the stratosphere with crazy life events, like getting married, Having children, I've got two kids myself. Um, crazy. Highly recommend it, but highly not recommend it too. <laughs> uh, just tell, ask me on a day like today. I'm away from them today, so I love them so much, and my wife, who surprised me and said she's coming down tonight. So that's awesome. Our anniversary was last weekend, and we didn't get to do anything because we had to take the kids to the zoo. So anyway, that's another story. But you know, balancing your life is important. You're, so you're going to start a company. That company is going to be a legitimate and an important part of your life. And you can't get away from that. It will live with you. It will stick with you. You'll be trying to do your fantasy football on Sunday afternoon, and all of a sudden, a lot of people looking at me like, what's fantasy football? <laughs> Geeks! <laughs> Come on, geeks, get into fantasy football. It's awesome. I'm in like four leagues. <laughs> I got teams playing each other. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do this weekend. I'm rooting for against myself in five leagues. So um, the point is really you now have a 
you have a, a, a competitor for your time and an enormous competitor for your time. Our business, we have a marketing software business we sell into healthcare, and it does really cool, awesome web scale kind of-esque stuff for the hospital industry as they try to acquire patients intelligently, for the ACO industry as they try to acquire patients intelligently. So that's what Bright Whistle does. We're based in Atlanta. We have three offices, Birmingham, Atlanta, New York, about 30, 30 35 people in the company. Um, so growing, we've raised venture capital. So now we have a lot of other stakeholders, some of which I like, some of which I don't, um, depending on the day of the week. But um, for the most part, I do, because they give us money so we could go build web scale. So anyway, um, I'm going to, so if you're writing it down or want to tweet, because this is going to be awesome, so you can just be a futurist and say, wow, this guy is so cool that I don't even need to see his presentation. That rocked. Or you could say it was a total dumpster fire, either way. Um, but in case you want to write that down, you can do that. Um, by the way, my wife told me not to wear this, which meant I was going to wear it. <laughs> Jen, I see Jen A.B. Um, you tweeted, all right. Woo! Um, so let me give you the cold water. You've already seen this like 98,000 times, but look it up on Mashable if you don't believe me. You start a big bit, you start a business, you know what? A quarter of those businesses within a year will be gone. Of the, of the ones remaining, a, roughly a third will be gone after year two, then half of those will be gone after year three, half of those will be gone after year four. Basically, you've got a 13% chance of succeeding if you make the assumption that a business has to exist four years or so. So is there any logical reason why anyone would start a company? No. Exact, that is the exact right answer. <laughs> There's no logical reason. I, I actually did an equation for a class at Tech. I went to Tech, um, Kirby and I. Anyway, and I took them through this, but I also took them through an equation. I said, all of you are smart enough to do investment banking, smart enough to do consulting. So I wrote up like basically cash flow statements across the board and the net present value of the cash flow statements at some terminal value with a discount rate. He's like, okay, don't geek out that way. <laughs> so, um, and then did it for like consulting and I did it for other industries, right? Then I did it for entrepreneur. And I put discount rates that are very different. Uh, and the, the model essentially says there is an enormous gap. And that gap is passion. That gap is your willingness to invest your time, your effort, your passion. And frankly, sacrifice a lot of your life. Money, potential for the future, uh, time with your kids, time with your, your spouse, your loved ones, etc. It's the only thing that separates, because otherwise you're all crazy people. Otherwise, we're all insane. Uh, under the assumption that you're either an entrepreneur or work for an entrepreneurial business or kind of work in this entrepreneurial world, right? The, the, it, the weird entrepreneur thing. Okay, so there is no logic. So don't go home and think, oh, I figured it out. There's a logical reason I should start a business from absolute nothing, absolute zero, and I'm going to succeed. No, you're not. You're going to fail. Now, here's the good news. You can fail a lot of times. So 13%, you know, compounded over some period of time. You know, you can fail, and if you fail fast, you can get back up and do it again and again. But the point is, you are most likely going to fail. I... I had uh, two fail. Well, I had a failure, and then I had. I was part of a company, and le I left too early. It ultimately succeeded, so I failed, but it succeeded. Uh, and then I had a, I would say, modest success, and sold that company. And then this has been a, a big success. So we'll have a good success here. But that's you know four companies since business school when B and I graduated from business school, um, over a 15-year span, right? One wife, two dogs, one of which has three legs, and two kids. 
spring of 2012, I'm going strong. Jen knows this. I was over at ATDC kicking butt. Bam, I get diagnosed with brain cancer. What the heck? Anaplastic gastrocytoma. Five-year survival rate. You got a one in a four chance of living past five years. I hadn't got to five years. Last time, 2014 minus 2012 equals five years. I don't ever know that. So I'm still in the mix, right? I'm still sort of in that group of people that should be dead in a few years. So that's what I look like. I took my kids up to Harvard Business School. They love going to Boston. I took them to campus, showed them around. They thought it was cool. The one on the left is still with a pacifier. That's my now four-year-old. And the one on the right is now my now six-year-old. So my big question is at that point, am I going to die? What will happen to my family? And then what will happen to my business? My business is an extension of my family. I mean, these people are, I, you know, I asked them to come do this crazy thing with me. I gave them equity instead of a lot of cash. You know, I said, don't take a $150,000 engineering job. Take a $100,000 engineering job, and I'll make up for it on the back end when we exit. Um, I survived. He took away the pacifier. He spit that out and now sticks out his tongue on uh, a regular, uh, okay, on a regular occasion. And uh, this is Florida at, our, at Pickles, our favorite restaurant in Seaside, if you've been there. Anyway, um, so, you know, back in, the, back in the thick of things, I'm not going to die anytime soon, I hope. So my priorities got kind of shifted. I started looking at my priorities. At, on that trip, even after cancer, and that was a year after, so I'd gone through radiation, chemo, all that stuff, right? Um, I was still working. That entire trip, pretty much, I worked. And my wife was like, what are you doing? And she was exactly right. And there was a point sort of in between the, when that picture was taken and the time we got back that I said, hey, I got I to gotta reprioritize. I've got to reprioritize, because this is insane. Like, I could die at any point. So I'm giving you kind of like the hyperbolic, right, example, because it's the easiest one, I think, to, to get across and to understand. I hope nobody in this room gets cancer. There may be some folks in here that have had it, uh, or certainly there are folks in here who have been affected by it, a loved one, someone like that. We're all affected by it. So the question I asked myself on the way back from Florida, it's a long trip, especially with two toddlers. <laughs> you gotta go to the bathroom, Daddy. Shut up. Um, how do you allocate your time? So I thought about, you know, when do I go into the office? How much time do I spend in the office? I live in Marietta. I work in Atlanta. That's an hour and 15-minute commute. So in a given week, I basically got somewhere in the, in, the, in the realm of 12 hours in the car. So half a day I spend in a Jeep. I have a Jeep now, by the way. He had a Jeep. Used to. It's awesome. So it's cool to be in a Jeep, but not, not for 12 hours, as it turns out. Not in traffic. <laughs> so how much time do I spend at the office, getting to the office? How much do I spend time, you know, how much time do I spend at home? You know, and with friends and with family. And so this is a Clay Christensen question. Right? Has anybody read the book, How You, How you Measure Your Life? It's, a, it's one of those books, but it was post his you know, near-death experience. Um, you know, I, so I thought of this in terms of dimes or donuts. As a dad with toddlers, you are always guilted into going to have breakfast or lunch with your kids at their school. And most often, it involves donuts. Don't, tell, don't ask me why. It's a conspiracy. Somehow, Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts has figured out that it'll attract dads because we're all fat and stuff and lazy. Um, you know, so what, what do the Marines say? Unicor, God, country, right? It's that, that priority list is ingrained in them from day one. Unicor, God, country. So what is my list? What is my priority list? Um, so my point of view, sort of take it or leave it, is 
you got to spend your time at the office efficiently. You will find yourself, yeah, of course, as a CEO, you know, if you're, if you're a CEO, if you're a leader in the office or the business, you've got to spend time talking to folks, building relationships, that sort of thing, right? At the same time, you will find yourself wasting time. You'll find yourself getting distracted with all kinds of things that completely have nothing to do with the business. It's success, the success of the employees. Nothing whatsoever. But you're spending time on it, okay? You got to get away from that, right? So that's a, that's a big issue. Efficient work at your office means you get to leave. And it doesn't matter what level you are. I have people in my office that leave at 4 o'clock in a startup. That's unheard of. But they've, they do awesome work when they're in the office, and I never ask a question. Their manager never asks a question. Do, do work efficiently and do it well, and you'll have more time for other things. But you have to consciously think about it. If you work at home during hours like your kids are you know, up and awake or your spouse is up and awake or your friends are doing something that you want to be part of or there's a thing that really, you know, is fulfilling to you and you're working during that time, that's essentially absence from your home. It's as if, I mean, don't think just because you're home, oh, I'm, I'm home, but I'm in the bed doing work and my kids are, you know, yelling and screaming and they want me to come down and play chess or something. Yeah, you're, you're working. I, you know, and it gets, a lot of these things happen. It's happened to me a lot where my, da, my uh, sons will say, well, you're always on the phone anyway. So you're like, damn, sorry uh, for cussing. I don't ever get to do that. I have two kids. So you're just like, crap, crud. <laughs> crud, I can't believe he called me out on that, right? So, but it's true. I'm on the phone. Hey, you know, I'll even try to, I'll do things like, oh, it's Mr. Chad. They know Mr. Chad, my business partner. Oh, it's Mr. Chad. Hey, Mr. Chad. I'll be in the, I'll be in the Jeep, you know, I'll have it on Bluetooth. Say hello to Mr. Chad, guys. Hey, Mr. Chad. Hey, guys. You know, and then I'm talking to Chad about something they have no idea what's going on. They'll go to sleep. So that's complete wasted time, right? So you work at home and you work during time where they're awake or they're present, or your friends are doing something, or you want to be sailing, or whatever it is you, you do, that's, you might as well be at the office. You might as well be at the office. And they see it. See, that, that's the problem, right? Your absence is one thing. Your presence and working is almost worse because you're right there. You're within distance of their hand, little hand, or whatever it is, but they can't get to you. You're not there. Donuts are greater than dimes. So that's kind of my little phrase. Donuts are better than dimes. They're more valuable than dimes. Money, you, you, don't, you didn't bring anything into this world, you ain't bringing anything out. So now I am Joel Osteen, I guess. <laughs> You're not leaving with any money. Now you may leave money to other people, that's a noble cause and one for which you might find great pleasure, but you're not leaving the world, you know, with any cash. They don't throw it in the casket on your way out. But you're not in Egypt. You're not a pharaoh. Sorry to blow that up. Anybody see Munich, the movie? Awesome movie, one of the best films you'll ever see. If you haven't seen it, it's about the Olympics in 72 when the um, Israeli uh, athletes were killed. And then what occurred at really what occurred after that when the state of Israel then went after the guys who perpetrated the crime. There's a great scene between Eric Bana's character, Avner, who's basically the, the leader of this group going after the bad guys, and Papa, you don't know his name, but he's played by Michael Lonsdale, who by the way played the bad guy in Moonraker, if you're a Bond aficionado like I am. Um, so he basically sells information to spies and other folks. Um, and, and they have this close bond and develop this close relationship in a very short period of time, I mean, literally like an afternoon. Uh, Papa does not really love his kids. He, he grows very bonded to Avner. 
And in any case, he, but he says this line, they're sitting there eating dinner, and he's, uh, he says to him, you could have been my son, but you're not. Remember that. We'll do business, but you're not family. And I think about that a lot because there are arguments I get in with my investors, my business partners, my employees, folks that work with us, partners of all sorts. Um, and I, and I, want, I expect from them things oftentimes that I expect from my family. And they expect things from me as if I'm their family. And I want to trust somebody, and I want them to trust me, and I want to treat them ethically, and I want to treat them to treat me ethically. And sometimes you are in a ditch with a soldier, you know, and that's probably the best description of a, of a startup. You know, you're at war, right, against the world, against fate, against that logic we talked about earlier. And it does feel like family. But guess what? It's not. It's not family. It's not. So remember that. Remembering that, I think, is incredibly important. You're making these little decisions oftentimes. Do I leave now? Do I stay another 15 minutes? Do I go to that event? Because I, I want to make sure my face is seen at that event with Jen Bonet because she's going to get on to me the next day. Um, or do I go see my kids and get there in time for dinner? Sorry, Jen, I'm, I'm going home. I have divorced myself from sort of the Atlanta entrepreneur scene, for a while at least. And I get calls from all these people, hey, come to this, do this, do that. And I just, I go, I'll go to a couple, yes. I'm not going to all of them like I used to. Um, we'll do business, but you're not my family. Anyone watch the show? Please tell me. This is totally geek. I mean, if this... Whoever at CBS produces this show should have sponsored this event, right? I mean, Big Bang Theory is, without a doubt, one of the geekiest, awesomest shows, right? So I was going to memorize this and really impress y'all and get a lot of tweets as a result. Uh, couldn't do it. Could not do it. I had brain cancer. I had a lot of stuff. To so that's, by the way, a great excuse. Get brain cancer. You can do all kinds of things with it. I didn't remember to bring on bread. I had brain cancer, for crying out loud. <laughs> Woman? <laughs> of course I didn't remember our anniversary. Hello? Cancer in my head? Uh, it works for about three months with your wife, six months to 12 months with your mom. Your mom's always better. Oh, how are you doing? I'm fine. I can't remember anything, Mom, like your birthday, but I'm fine. Scissors cuts paper, paper covers rock. Rock crushes lizard, lizard poisons Spock. Spock smashes scissors, scissors decapitates lizard, lizard eats paper, paper disproves Spock. Spock vaporizes rock, and as always has it, rock crushes scissors. And I tried my best. Anyway, I just read it, <laughs> if you didn't notice. Faith, money, fame, faith. So it's rock, paper, scissors, shoot, right? There was a kid when I was growing up, and there's a uh, sample episode about this as well who would always go rock, paper, scissors, rock. He always thought rock destroyed everything. Rock crushes, the, just whips right through paper. Come on, crushes scissors. And if you've got a rock, my rock is bigger than your rock, smash. Or he'd do the dynamite thing or the gun. He'd invent things, right? It's like, you, you know, I can't blow with you anymore. But actually, he had it right. Faith, money, fame, faith. Faith in yourself, faith in something bigger. I have a Christian faith. You may not have a Christian faith. You may have a deist faith. Um, I believe very strongly in what I believe. Um, but I will say to you, believing in something that's bigger than you is incredibly important. And if you don't have that, you need to take a look at yourself, in my opinion. Again, this started from, in my humble opinion, my point of view, take it or leave it. This is a part where I say take it or leave it. So if you don't have that faith... In, in something. Um, happy to talk to you afterwards about my faith, and I'm very open with it. Um, but, you know, from, from my perspective, he's got it right. You know, at the end of the day, rock crushes scissors. Faith, in this case, always triumphs. The rock triumphs. So keep that in mind. I like this, it just, you know, again, faith, money, fame, faith. What do we, as if, what do we say is, 
entrepreneurs, what we do to logically explain ourselves is, well, we don't make any money, but then we're going to go public, or then we're going to sell for a ton of money, like David Cummings in Atlanta, or Tom Noonan in Atlanta, or whomever in Atlanta, or whomever in the Valley, I keep saying Atlanta, or Savannah, or Charleston, or wherever, right? And we're just going to make a gob of money, and it won't matter that we didn't make all this money before, because it's all going to be made up for on the back end. It's all about money. A lot of it is about money. Let's just be honest. We all think of that, right? And we say, well, we love what we do. And, may, and I think that's true. I'm not suggesting that you don't love what you do. Um, but, but a lot of us are, are intrinsically motivated by stuff, material stuff. You can read this, but I, I love the last line. Can anyone imagine Moses, Jesus, or Gandhi armed with the money bags of Carnegie? Now, Carnegie is important. He did a lot for the world as a, a benefactor. But you know, the point's taken, right, by the smartest man in the world ever. That essentially, guess what, you know? Th these were people with missions. They, they, had, they, were, they were poor for the most part. They didn't have anything. They had missions, and they were, they were important to them, and they felt very passionate about them. Passionate about so something and having that. On, on, on your gravestone, what will it say? It won't have a dollar sign. I can guarantee that, unless you wanted to have one. Um, if anyone does, I have a guy who's starting a company doing that. This is an actual picture of me. I am not kidding. Okay, so here's the explanation, all right? Let me just explain this before everybody starts laughing. Oh, you've already started laughing, okay. My wife and I had first, this is when we first started dating, and she's like, I'm on this kickball team. Do you want to play? I was 26, I think, 25. Anyway, do you want to play? And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun, you know, kind of, gosh, that harkens back to like third grade kickball. So we go to play kickball. One of her friends uh, took this picture. I literally missed the ball. How do you do that? Like, it's almost physically impossible. It defies all of the immutable laws of physics, right? A big red ball is coming towards you. Your job is to just make contact with it. Some contact, even if it's like... Just nip it on the top of it or something, you know? Top it and just go. It's like a bunt and go to first base. Look at that dude out there. He's ready. He's ready to get it. He pitched it to me. I couldn't, I didn't kick it. And I love this line. This is one of those like successories, but like anti successories. You'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And statistically speaking, 99% of the ones you do. Kobe Bryant set a record the other night. Did anybody know what he set a record for? Most missed field goals. Most missed field goals. You could laugh, right? And he's kind of a pain in the butt. Ne nevertheless, an incredible player, Hall of Famer, blah, blah, blah. He's got more rings than I do. Uh, but think about that. He took a lot, he's taken a lot of shots. He's missed a lot of shots, more than anyone else in history. <laughs> But he's taken a lot of shots, and he's won championships. Um, that said, I'll also say the, core, the sort of antithesis to that is this idea that you, are, you have to take all the shots. You're the only person that matters in your company. We all develop a sense of self. The ego and the superego take over. I don't know about the id. I'm not a psychology major. I'm a mechanical engineering major, like uh, Kirby was. But I don't even know what that is. In any case, the ego takes over. We're awesome. Nobody else is. I got to be there. I'm the CEO or I'm the COO. I'm the CTO. I'm the head of engineering. I'm the Ruby guy. I'm the whatever developer. I'm the HTML person. I've got to be there, MongoDB administrator. Um, I've got to be there if we're going to go web scale. You know? And guess what? It, it, it's going to live without you. And that helps you, it should help you think about all the other things we just talked about because the idea from my perspective is, guess what, you know, take a day off, take an hour off, take 30 minutes and walk around and get your thoughts collected. I do that every day. Every day I walk around the building, the building. I look a crazy guy. I'm sure people are like, who is that guy that comes by our office every day? Does he go to the bathroom that many times? 
Lord, he's got a problem, incontinence or something. He looks young. Maybe he had cancer. Anyway, <laughs> I can laugh about that. None of y'all can laugh about that. What are you doing? So questions. Um, let's, let's talk about it, and I'll, I'm happy to answer questions too. But um, anybody else have tips about how they keep balance in their lives? Anyone? Um, yeah, the thought that occurred to me as I was listening to you, because I went through a process where I've gone from, you know, long days to here's what I do now. And, and one of the things that helped me a lot was push, push delete on email. That's my tip. <laughs> Definitely. There's a whole other email protocol I've never learned. Like you're supposed to come in, do email for like 30 minutes, leave it and then come back at the end of the day. I've never learned that. If anyone has that book or whatever source, please send me at Jack G. Foster. We my name a lot, a lot, so I get a lot of followers because that's important. That's, on, that's gonna be in my gravestone. Number of Twitter followers, bam. It's gonna be digital, so it just keeps going. <laughs> All right, other tips. Mindful of space stress reduction. Mindfulness. Mindfulness based stress reduction. Mindfulness based stress reduction. Explain a little bit more. It is, um, well, it's work friendly because it's uh, not faith based, but it's uh, meditation. Yep. Um, and basically, you use, can you hear me? Yep. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> you just do some breathing techniques. And uh, you bring it back into the now, into the moment, so that you can, um, like you were talking about, you know, getting up and walking around for 30 minutes or doing something for 30 minutes just so you can, you know, refocus. Right. This is something that everybody can do um, wherever they are. Take two or three minutes. You know, you close your eyes. You do some, you know, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. Yeah. And yeah. what it does, it helps you to kind of recenter. Yeah, and then the reason why I, I like it a lot is, you know, I have I have uh, my Christian faith as well, right. but I have a lot of friends who have different faith systems. Yeah, right. And so I respect that, and this is something that you can do at anywhere with anybody, and it doesn't infringe on anyone's belief systems. Right. I love it. Yeah. Yes. Great one. I have to. Yes. Uh, yes to no. Um, I, it's funny. We have a, a young guy in our office. This isn't against anybody who's young. I'm 41 now, so I'm not young anymore, uh, quote unquote. Um, Kirby, you're older than me, so I'm young to you. <laughs> but um, I have a guy. He's probably our most productive guy in the entire office. He is a single point of failure. Now, he thinks he's the most valuable player. And he is to some degree. From one point of view, you could say, wow, if you lost him, you guys would be completely up you-know-what creek without a paddle. Um, notice I said you-know-what creek. Anyway, um, I look at him, and the other day he complained about a situation. And I said, you know, you just got to say no to the guy. I can't say no. He's the CTO or something. I said, he works for me. I just told you, say no to the guy. If he, if he has a problem, he can, talk, he can come talk to me. You don't have time for that. And by the way, the more you become a single point of failure, you become more of a liability to the business. I'm going to fire you. If you fire me, the whole thing falls apart. Right. It, later, like in the future, there will be a time where if I fire you, it falls apart. So I'm going to fire you now. That way, I can replace you, and it doesn't fall apart. You get the picture here, young person, right? But I said, you're, I'm telling you, if you don't start saying no, I will fire you. I literally said that. And he's like, you're not serious. I'm like, I am dead serious, man. I had brain cancer, all right? <laughs> I am freaking serious. I will fire your dude. All day long. I'll put you on MongoDB. I don't care. But you're going to be doing something else. There's one, there's something over here. Yes. I mean, I'm lucky. I live in Savannah most of the time, but either walk or ride my bike to at least one appointment. A day. You are lucky. 
I love this. This is my favorite city in the world. B knows that. Um, I can't, we came here on vacation as kids every year in the spring. So anyway, I love Savannah. Yeah, live someplace. I mean, yeah, start your company in an awesome place like Savannah and not a congested place like Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, I'd say invite someone to call you out. You can't always yeah. tell when you're out of balance. So maybe it's a spouse, a right. peer, uh, but just having a relationship with somebody who can look at you and say, dude, you've got something messed up right now. You need to fix it. Yeah. You know, there's, there's generally, or there's a lot of theory at, uh, about when you start a company, the success rate of companies that are started by two or three founders versus just one singular person. And the ones that have two or three, generally speaking, do better. And part of that, my business partner, if he were here, he would say absolutely nothing. Jen knows him. Chad is awesome. Uh, he is the exact opposite of me in almost every way. I mean, he's not good looking. He doesn't have brain cancer. <laughs> he is so cool. Calm, collected. He knows his katra, whatever that, you know, he, know, he is mindful, man. He is totally zen, right? And he will call me out. There's somebody else. Yes. I recently attended a uh, talk with Kevin Lawver, and he was uh, and he's speaking at this conference as well. And he recommended or highly suggested that we all sort of nix email as much as possible. So oh, yeah. I, in the last month, we've instituted a new sort of policy that we cannot email each other internally. That we have to do everything through a project management system or just some other kind of software so we can manage our time better. And I think it's increased our productivity significantly. Oh, don't you love the emails between two people, but they've copied like nine other people. <laughs> and you know, if you're a leader in your business, you have got to put an end to that. And you know why you put an end to it? You say, I will fire you. <laughs> no, I, the way I put an end to it is I pick up the phone and I call the person and I call the other person and I say, stop. The flame war needs to stop. You guys need to get on the same page. You know, we are not going from MySQL to MongoDB. I've made that decision, so stop talking about it. There was something up here, and I know we're running out of time, so we're getting kind of short. I'm sorry. What was the? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I think I'm going to summarize this, that you need to trust your partners and your teammates. Going back to Kobe Bryant, to me, Kobe Bryant is the worst player right. for right now because you cannot win with Kobe and, and all this. I think if you trust the people that are around you, and I find that at work, you can do better. But if you are in an environment that the people around you are, are, are not as good as they should be, then you, you're going to run. I totally agree with that. And we got burned. I, I'll say it in public, and I really don't care. You can tweet it all you want. We have an investor. We have three investors, two of whom are awesome and have our backs, and one dude who's an out-of-town guy, and I'll just say I'll leave it at that. You can go on our website, and you'll know instantly who the guy is. Bam. Uh, again, I, I've got cancer, so. Um, and basically, I trusted him. I was literally in my convalescence right after surgery, in between surgery and radiation, and we had a term sheet come in for our second round of capital. And I had two competing term sheets. One of them was from a guy with a firm, and I had gone to college with him. Um, I'd been on a board with a guy when I was a VC, and I'd, I had some issues with him, too. But I ultimately took the term sheet from the other dude because he was in our deal first. And my general rule is, hey, if you're an investor, a previous investor, you're giving us a fair term sheet, you get a home team, you know, a hometown discount, right? Trusting that he would be a partner, like, and that one decision, choosing a not, not as good term sheet over this other person, would, it, would sort of deliver that trust. It, has, it hasn't. And it's a very sad thing to learn, learn the hard way, right? I learned a, I've learned a, an extremely valuable lesson, and, and that's too bad. Um, one, maybe, all these things were just, um, you know, just asking questions you might want to think about. Maybe one more, then we're done, I think.
141. Maybe we, yes. Um, my two cents would be positive energy. And I, you've shown some here today, but we, a lot of times people think that if I say something negative, I look smarter. And the more I've been around world leaders, brilliant people, they are the positive people. And there's no more greater loss of energy than that negative comment. It, it'll just, it'll take you 10 times as much time as what, what you could have accomplished with a positive statement. Totally agree with that. And people who say those types of things too, you often see that they say the same thing over and over and over again. And what happens is to those, those people become noise. You stop listening to them. They lose credibility just by virtue of the fact that you know what they think. So there's nothing new, right, coming out of their mouth. They're going to say the same things are broken that they always say are broken. That's a great point. One last thing. Come on. Yes. I like to spend a few minutes every day and reflect on the three things that I'm most thankful for, as well as the best thing that happened to me all day. And, uh, and I was diagnosed with cancer about nine months ago, nine, 11 months ago, something along those lines, and I just got done with it. So when wow. I can't think of anything- We're I, brothers, man. No doubt, yeah. Uh, every time I, anyone complains, usually my wife, I just tell her, well, at least, I don't have cancer right now. Right. So there's that. There's that. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that's exactly right. I, I think that's exactly right. And it seems as simple and sort of childish almost, but it's, you know, it's childish stuff that's almost always the most effective. Don't be the negative guy. You know, be thankful for things. Think of the first, think of the, t I asked our kids at the dinner table, what are the best things that happened to you today? Tell me. That's the best time in the world. You listen and they'll tell you all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, I built this. Or this guy told me that I had a, my hair was cool today or whatever, you know. And that's neat because it's simplistic and it gets you back to where, to that mindfulness of who you are. You don't take yourself too seriously like we talked about, right? So, hey, I'm, I'll be out there if you want to talk at all or uh, anything like that. But I appreciate your time. Go get them. Don't worry about the 13%. I'm just telling you the passion gap is all I was trying to get to. So don't everybody tweet, Craig's a negative guy. He thinks we're all going to fail. Hashtag, hashtag bad guy. Okay. Thanks.